We remember that when people lose their lives as a consequence of injustice, their spirit wanders, unable to pass over, seeking resolution. We remember that our lives are a continuation of those who have come before and that many of those who are kin have died as a consequence of injustice and so are wandering, seeking resolution. We remember that as long as the souls of our kin wander, then so do we, so we make places for their souls to be. We are helped to remember our right to be here. We are helped to remember our responsibilities. We create our justice daily, we do. Hi, I'm Pierre Gabriel Foreman, a literary historian based at University of Delaware. And for Perpetude, repurposing social media spaces, I wanna talk about the ways in which gathering and gaining access to the records and artifacts of our ancestors is crucial to our understanding of the past and the present. This matters particularly in the excavation of a past black women's history in my research that has, to borrow from Toni Morrison, not been accidentally forgotten, but actively disremembered. I want us to hold that word on our tongues for a moment, disremembered. Dissed and disrespected, surely, but also dismembered, taken apart separated from the body, politic. Burying a people's history takes place after acts of violence, that term reminds us. As scholars seeking to be relevant in and beyond the academy, we seek to be guided by a spirit of resurrection. The terms perpetuate explores resonate as each day's exhibit unfolds during the summer of 2011 against the front drop of debt ceiling debates and stock market free falls, credit rating downgrades, unrest across Great Britain, and a shift in political discourse toward what we must cut, the danger of that sharp knife-edged evident held tight as a switchblade. How do we understand and organize these concepts, political and economic isolation and distraction, global economic connection, depth and death, global and political chaos and control here in this gallery space and in its extension on the streets, in the political and policy debates, in organizing. Imperative's previous considerations of high art and low art, of what counts as depth and what counts as distraction, make me think about the shadow concepts of high history and low history and the echo chamber questions of what counts as real history, the history that gets remembered or included and integrated as ex explanation as a legitimate rubric that informs media coverage, policy, and the possibility of redress. What has haunted me over the years is how easily black women's lives are carelessly unearthed. The evidence of our work scattered and thrown away. Had her own mother's story been lost, Alice Walker wrote in Saving the Life That Is Your Own, it would have no historical underpinning, none which I could trust anyway. As I join others, as students join me, to recover the buried archival remnants that seem to have both stubbornly and patiently waited for our coming, what has inspired me is our ancestors' literary activism and the ways in which we, their cultural kin build on their struggles for expression and justice. My research is meant to help recover the individual strands and collective strains of their stories. To my mind, to my ears, it sounds as if they call on us to do more than that. The present recognition and even popularity of 19th century studies of gender and, and race coexist with political breakthroughs and our own new nadir. They're coval temporal happenings on a completely different time curve. Despite the achievement and power of some individuals of African American and Latino descent, despite this post-racial moment, black and brown communities bear the brunt of economic, educational, and medical violence as principal targets. In LA where I live, we experience hate crimes at a rate nearly 10 times higher than any other group and are victims in more than 50% of crime. 
In the US, black women are the fastest growing population in the incarceration industry, a campaign that has over one million African Americans, about half of all inmates imprisoned. As black women, we make up nearly 70% of newly diagnosed HIV cases in the US. This year, a study found that while the median net worth of, white, of single white women ages 36 to 49 is $42,600, that's just 61% of the median wealth for same age single white men, mind you. Single women of color in the same age group, that's my age group, have a medium wealth of just $5. That's not an error. There are no missing zeros here. Single black women my age, between 36 and 49, have a median net worth of $5. And add to this that in cities such as Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, and Detroit, between 66 and 75% of black male high school students do not graduate. These are the uncultivated fields of our destiny, to borrow from the unidentified author whose words you just so beautifully spoke. They are our gardens untended, overgrown, and malnourished. Over my research with students hover the ghosts of recovered archives and ancestors. They infer, inform my critical discussion about texts, their histories, and the critical apparatuses we bring to interpretation. They make visits to my classrooms and appear on the walls of my home. And that brings us back to homes and how we find them, how we create historical and political homes, home for art, activism and the archive and social media spaces, homes as virtual, global, resistant, critical, engaged spaces we can live in, spaces that call for us to refracture and reintegrate into our understanding the terms and ideas perpetuity is showcasing depth and distraction, isolation and connection, chaos and control, and also the audacity of organizing, of accountability, and of justice.